First, I want to thank Giorgio De Finis, the director, for inviting me. I want to thank Giovanna Virga and her colleagues for arranging things. Alessandra Ranunci for translating. But most importantly, Fabio Benincasa, who for 10 months now has exchanged emails and given advice and just gave us a tour of your beautiful new museum. Grazie. All right. Art and Scent Interpreting the Olfactory Arts. Over the last two decades, the natural and human sciences have positively reappraised the value of smell. And at the same time, there has been a flourishing of the use of smell in the arts. It's time for aesthetics and art theory to take notice of the many remarkable artworks of various kinds addressed to our sense of smell. First, works for museums and galleries. Ottobong Nakande's Anamnesis is a long freestanding white wall with a dark river-like incision running all around it at nose level. She filled the incision with aromatic coffee beans, chopped tobacco leaves, cloves, and other spices of the kind that had been exploited in the African colonial trade. As visitors walked around and smelled the brown slash, they were given a palpable experience of Nakanda's anti-colonial message. <coughs> Christoph Laudamiel's Over 21 offered visitors a very different kind of olfactory experience. Laudamiel placed 10 canisters of synthetic scents around a dining table. At the opening of the exhibit, visitors dipped perfume blotters into a small hole in the top of each canister, inhaled the scents, and wrote down their reactions. Peter de Couperet's tree virus consisted of a large ball of peppermint and white pepper with a dead tree sitting on top of it. The odor was so pungent that many of the people who went inside to see and smell tree virus quickly ran out again, their eyes burning. In 2015, the Tanguele Museum in Basel presented a survey of over 60 olfactory artworks, past and present. But museum and gallery works are not the only kinds of contemporary olfactory art. Odors are also being used to enhance works of theater, such as the French drama Parfum de l'âme, that released a dozen strategic scents from beneath theater scent seats. Or Green Aria, a scent opera that combined electronic music with 30 odors to narrate an environmental message. Meanwhile, designers have been using smells to create signature scents for hotels, nor must we forget perfume and incense, the most ancient olfactory arts. And finally, some scholars include in the category olfactory art works of literature, music, or painting that only represent odors, such as Calvino's Il Nome, Il Naso, 
or Debussy's Peleus et Melisande, or Duccio's painting Resurrection de Lazaro that shows the figure just to the right of center holding his nose at the stench. <clears throat> Current critical opinion is divided over how many of these things should be included under the title Olfactory Art. The Italian art historian Francesca Bacci and the French philosopher Chantal Jacquet define olfactory art broadly to include most of the things I mentioned. But a leading art critic and curator of olfactory art, the Canadian Jim Drobnik, restricts the meaning of the term to works that combine sense with sculpture, installations, and other visual art medium for galleries and museums. Although I personally agree with Bacci and Jacquet, uh, since this lecture is for an art museum audience, I will not discuss the use of odors to enhance theater, music, and painting. Uh, <clears throat> The focus of this evening's lecture then will be on olfactory artworks that are intended for galleries and museums and that intentionally use actual odors in a prominent way. But first, I need to confront some reasons that using odors in art challenges audiences. The first is Westerners generally low estimate of the sense of smell. Most of us hardly pay attention to the odors around us. And when people are asked which of the senses they would give up if they had to, they often name smell. Indeed, in an era when we spend so much of our time staring at our cell phones, notepads and computers, it might seem that vision and hearing are gaining an even greater hold over our daily lives at the expense of smell, taste, and touch. Most of our foods and household products are scented, and many stores and hotels have ambient odors. Even our digital devices may eventually be programmed to emit odors of our choosing. Yet the possibility that our cell phones, notepads, and computers will one day allow us to send each other odor messages may depend less on the success of inventors than on whether they can overcome the public's lack of interest in smell. A second reason for the challenge is the negative intellectual tradition. Many theorists of the past, such as Darwin and Freud, have disdained smell as the least useful and most animalistic of the senses, viewing it as a kind of pre-human vestige in the course of disappearing. Good for Neanderthals, perhaps, but no longer needed by Homo sapiens. Darwin wrote, quote, Smell is of extremely slight service, if any, even for savages. When it comes specifically to aesthetics and art theory, there is also a negative intellectual tradition, reaching from Kant and Hegel to contemporary philosophers claiming that odors and the sense of smell cannot possibly be the basis of genuine artworks. C, the deodoration as deodorization of Western cities. A third reason for the neglect of smell is that since the 18th century, <clears throat> most upper class people in the West have lived in areas of cities from which many once notable odors have been eliminated, 
except, of course, auto exhaust or when the garbage collectors go on strike. Uh, from the ancient world down to the 19th century, smells in general and perfume and incense in particular played a much more important role in medicine, in religion, uh, and in everyday life than today. But beginning in the 1980s, both the sciences and the humanistic disciplines have rediscovered the positive value of the sense of smell. Let's begin with biology. In biology, the rediscovery began with the exploration of retronasal smell in the brain's construction of flavor. The term retronasal refers to the way odor molecules from our food reach our nasal receptors via an opening at the back of our mouths when we eat. Thus, there are two kinds of smell. Orthonasal smell, which occurs when odors enter from outside. Retronasal smell, which occurs from the inside. Our brains almost instantly combine these information sources to produce the experience of flavor. Many biologists and psychologists estimate that 80% of what we experience as the flavor or taste of our food actually comes from retronasal smell. You can test this yourself, by the way, by biting into a strawberry or other flavorful fruit while holding your nose. Secondly, uh, discoveries in neuroscience and psychology have shown that humans are excellent at detecting smells and can quickly learn new ones. Humans can detect as little as one part per billion of mercapan, the chemical that is put into odorous natural gas to aid in discovering leaks. One part per billion is the equivalent of three drops of wine in an Olympic-sized swimming pool. Other studies have shown that when people are given pieces of clothing recently worn by relatives or even friends, most can easily pick out the piece uh, that was worn by a family member. In a more amusing experiment, psychologists have demonstrated that humans wearing knee pads are quite good at tracking smells while crawling through the grass and can improve with practice. Finally, several psychologists who study long-term memory have confirmed the insight of Marcel Proust and other writers that smells have an exceptional power to evoke <coughs> vivid and emotion-laden memories from childhood. History, Anthropology, Linguistics. <clears throat> At the same time, biology and psychology have been reappraising smell. Historians have demonstrated its crucial role in the past. Anthropologists have shown that it still plays a pervasive role in many small-scale societies. And linguists have shown that several non-Western languages have developed abstract odor vocabularies. When we combine these recent discoveries of historians, anthropologists, and linguists with the evidence from biology and psychology, the negative views of Darwin and Freud now seem completely out of date. As the neuroscientist Gordon Shepard has written, quote, rather than being weak and vestigial, human smell appears to be quite powerful. <clears throat> uh, 
the sensory revolution in the arts. Given the positive reappraisal of the sense of smell by the sciences and disciplines, it is no surprise that visual artists have also been rediscovering the powers of smell <coughs> since the 1980s. Looked at historically, contemporary visual artists' use of odors in their works now seems like an inevitable outcome of the post-medium and conceptual turns in the visual arts since the 1960s, when movements like Arte Povera here in Italy or Neo Dada in the United States began to use all sorts of unconventional materials, from fat and felt to blood and dirt to make art that emphasized ideas rather than formal beauty. Finally, critics discover the olfactory arts. By the 1990s, there were enough such works that the term olfactory art became a focus of discussion by critics and curators. To give you an idea of the great variety of olfactory artworks, here's a partial list with an example of each. <clears throat> Hybrids of odors with paint. Several artists have encapsulated odors into special paints that can be spread on gallery walls where the scent is released when someone touches the wall. Sicil Tolas use this procedure for the fear of smell and the smell of fear. Tolas collected sweat samples from nine men subject to anxiety attacks encapsulated in a paint that visitors released as they moved around the room. Scent sculptures uh, such as Ernesto Nido's mother body densities in which huge lycra sacks filled with aromatic spices are from, hung from a gallery ceiling. Scent installations. Janice Cunelis, who as most of you know, lived and worked in Rome until his death in 2017 created this installation consisting of hanging steel trays filled with ground coffee beans that gave off a rich odor as one walked among them. Perfume-like works. I say perfume-like to emphasize that these are singular works and are not intended to be sold for wearing. Such works often involve unpleasant body odors, such as Clara Ursites Eau Claire, which included her vaginal smells. Scent performances. In Rachel Morrison's Smelling the Books, she set about systematically smelling each of the books in the library of the Museum of Modern Art and recording her impressions. Atmospheres. These are works where the odors are diffused into a largely empty space. In this work, the gallery is semi-dark so that your senses switch to smell, touch, and hearing. Finally, scent organs. <clears throat> the idea of creating a keyboard instrument that would release scents and combinations of them has been around since the 19th century. The most recent and versatile such organ is Wolfgang Georgsdorf's Smeller 2.0, an enormous machine with 64 pipes that can be computer programmed to play innumerable combinations. It can also be played spontaneously from a MIDI keyboard to accompany poetry, music, or film. 
Still, one might ask, is olfactory art a coherent category? I think there are three kinds of evidence that it names the category with enough cohesion to be added to our art vocabulary. History. As often happens with new movements in the arts, historians soon discover more distant precedents. The art historian Caro Ferbeek has found a forerunner of olfactory art in Italian futurism. In 1911, uh, Carlo Cara issued his manifesto, Pittura dei Suoni Rumori Odori. He was not thinking of representing smells as Duccio did in The Resurrection of Lazarus, but of the painter finding in smells and sounds an impetus to paint. Ennio Valentinelli's futurist manifesto, L'arte degli odori, declared, we have to start conquering the senses that have been elusive until now to force the reluctance of the senses when it comes to stench. Finally, Azari's La Flora Futurista called for replacing natural flowers with artificial one suffused with perfumes. Some advantages that artists and critics find in olfactory art. First, is that the volatility of odors requires the audience to be physically present and it engages them directly. Second, many contemporary artists are drawn to smell because odors arouse strong, highly personal emotional associations. Third, the supposed animality of smell and its close association with our bodily functions makes odors an ideal expressive medium for artists interested in identity and sexuality, such as Clara Ursiti and her Eau Claire. Fourth, some artists see the very difficulty of exhibiting preserving, selling olfactory art as one of the advantages for making art. Finally, another evidence that the term olfactory art names a useful category is that there are several artists today who publicly identify themselves as olfactory or scent artists. Here are a few. <clears throat> the Norwegian-born Sissel Tolas has a background in both chemistry and art, and her laboratory in Berlin contains an archive of thousands of smell samples. Tolas' mission is to get people to appreciate their own body odors as well as the odors of their everyday environment. Most of her works are actually smell profiles of cities. She has done over 35, which often result in artworks such as the four scents she synthesized for the Berlin Biennale of 2004, each representing a quadrant of the city. <coughs> The French perfumer artist Christophe Laudamiel is a multifaceted creator who has designed perfumes for major fashion and cosmetic companies and ambient odors for Armani, as well as creating 30 abstract odors for Green Aria, a scent opera. He has regularly shown olfactory artworks at the New York and Berlin galleries that represent him. And he's also created devices to make it easier for dealers and collectors to display and conserve his olfactory artworks. 
sent squares are devices that can be set in front of a painting or photo in order to enjoy a combined olfactory and visual experience by pressing a button on the bottom of the frame. Sent parables <coughs> are designed to contain four pieces of chalk saturated with scents designed by Lauda Miel. The owner needs only lift the lid of the bowl to smell the unique fragrance that is built up. Finally, in 2016, Lauda Miel published an eloquent manifesto, Liberté, Egalité, Fragrancité, whose demands range from scent education in the schools to establishing copyright for perfumes. Annika Yi, the Korean-American artist Annika Yi won the prestigious Hugo Boss Prize in 2016, partly for her way of using odors. In order to experience her installation work called Divorce, visitors must stick their heads into one of two clothes dryers and inhale a pungent odor that suggests a marriage gone bad. Yi says she uses strong smells in her works because she wants to tell gallery visitors, quote, get uncomfortable, get aroused, get in your pathetic body. This isn't an abstract painting. Oswaldo Masia of Colombia has been making works combining scents and sounds for over 20 years. One of his recent pieces shown here is a bathtub with a continuously running faucet that gives off a strong smell of carrots at the same time one hears the sound of machines stitching military clothing coming from a hidden speaker. In 2013, he issued a manifesto for olfactory acoustic sculpture. <clears throat> Finally, the Belgian Peter de Coupere is one of the most prolific olfactory artists practicing today he has produced work in almost every type of olfactory art, from installations like tree virus that we saw earlier, to scent paintings, scent sculptures, scent performances, even a scent piano he called the olfactiano. De Coupere has also been one of the most vocal advocates for olfactory art, and in 2014, he issued an olfactory art manifest that closes with this call to action. This manifest calls all artists to enter into the smell experience, calls all curators, museum directors to show more olfactory art. This manifest calls everyone to smell hard. How should we think of commercial perfumes, however, in comparison to artists' perfume-like works, such as Clara Ursiti's Eau Claire? Actually, many professional perfumers are convinced that perfumes should be considered works of art. For example, the Niche Perfume Company, Venice Olfactory, calls their perfumes uh, works of olfactory art, even avant-garde olfactory art. <coughs> 
But there are other perfumers and art theorists who think commercial perfumes are better understood as works of design. I believe most perfume, commercial perfumes should be classified as design, and there are three fairly obvious reasons. <clears throat> First, an artist's perfume-like work is primarily intended to be experienced for itself. That is, for its intrinsic olfactory interest, not used for something further, such as being worn on the body. Second, most artists' perfume creations are presented in art galleries and museums and perfumes in department stores, etc. Third, and most important, artists are free to choose their own themes and free to use any materials, including offensive body odors. But most perfumers are constrained by themes chosen by a client, such as a luxury fashion firm. And all perfumers are constrained by safety regulations, even here in the U EU, I think. Uh, Now let's compare an artist's perfume. In 2007, the New York artist Lisa Kirk created <coughs> Revolution Pipe Bomb, saying, quote, if we can't start a revolution, at least we can create a fragrance that symbolizes rebellion. She asked some journalists and political radicals she knew to tell her what a revolution smells like. <laughs> Reply, smoke, tear gas, burnt rubber, gasoline, decaying flesh. <coughs> then she commissioned a professional perfumer to simulate these odors. The result, if you smell the little blotter inside the envelope or just smell in the envelope, as you can see, it gives off a metallic, smoky odor. Uh, yeah, smell the small end of it. <laughs> She released this perfume in a limited edition of 28 in vessels that were made of precious metals, silver, gold, platinum, and sold them through an art dealer. Examples of the vessels were also exhibited, as you see in the photo, uh, at a branch of the Museum of modern art in New York. <clears throat> okay, had enough of revolution. <laughs> uh, let's try something pleasanter. Would you hand out the uh, second set of envelopes? <clears throat> Now let's compare Lisa Kirk's process. In creating Revolution Pipe Bomb with the process of the famous perfumer Jean-Claude Elena in creating Un Jardin en Méditerranée. 
Elena created Un Jardin in the same way most other product designs are created, <coughs> in response to what is called a design brief from a client. Most design briefs for perfume include not only the theme of the perfume, the target audience, cost limits, and how the new uh, scent will relate to competitors' perfumes. The brief that Elena followed came from the head of Hermes Perfume Division, who wrote, quote, Make me a perfume that smells of the scents found in a Tunisian garden. Thus, Elena, like most other professional perfumers who work for luxury brands, not only had to observe the general EU safety constraints, but it was also given a theme that limited the type of scents he could use. Personally, I think and Jardin en Méditerranée is a lovely and interesting scent. But, despite its expressive artistry, given the constraints of the design brief under which Elena worked, Un Jardin is more like other works of contemporary product design than it is like a free work of contemporary art such as Lisa Kirk's revolution. <clears throat> Even niche perfume companies cannot put out perfumes that smell of the vagina. <laughs> My preliminary conclusion is that the majority of today's finer perfumes for wear should be considered outstanding works of design, not free works of contemporary art. But to say that perfume belongs to design rather than to art is not to demote it. The best works of contemporary design, in my view, are the aesthetic and intellectual equal of the best works of contemporary art. In fact, there are many situations where design and art overlap. As we all know, many museums exhibit outstanding works of furniture or fashion to be appreciated for their conceptual and formal interest apart from their intended functions. And what has been done with fashion could also be done with perfumes. In fact, in 2012, the New York Museum of Arts and Design mounted an exhibition called The Art of Scent, in which a dozen classic commercial perfumes, including Chanel No. 5 and so on, were each spritzed from a shallow indentation in the wall and accompanied by a title, a date, and the creator's name as if they were paintings. Moreover, as we have seen, some uh, perfume designers, like Christophe Laudemiel, regularly take on the role of artist and even arrange their artwork so that visitors experience them in ways similar to the way they might test a commercial perfume. Conversely, some artists take on the role of designer. Lisa Kirk did that just two years after Revolution Pipe Bomb. She commissioned a perfume that this time she intended 
to be sold for wearing. And she simply called it revolution. But it comes in a generic, a generic little bottle, a few centimeters high, with a simple pasted on label. And you can currently buy it over the internet. Unlike her earlier work, Revolution Pipe Bomb, which was clearly contemporary art, shown in an art museum, sold uh, to art collectors through art dealers, the little bottle of Revolution stands ambiguously on the border between art and design. When you buy a bottle of Revolution from an online perfume site, are you buying a niche perfume or a piece of contemporary art? Is Lisa Kirk letting a wider audience participate in her art project of creating a, quote, perfume to symbolize rebellion? Or is she just selling another niche perfume, if a rather oddly unpleasant one? It's not easy to say. <clears throat> Some concluding thoughts. At the beginning of Il Nome Il Naso, Italo Calvino writes, Come epigraphi in un alfabeto indecifrabile, così voi restarete perfumere per l'uomo futuro. These words, first published in 1973, now seem unduly pessimistic. Reflecting as they do, the error of Darwin and Freud, who saw the human sense of smell as a primitive vestige in the course of disappearing. Since the time Calvino wrote Il Nome Il Naso, there has not only been a sensory awakening in the sciences that has revalued the sense of smell, but there has also been a sensory awakening in contemporary art and design. Over the last two decades, as we have seen, many artists have begun using odors in their works. Uh, currently, there are at least two works here at Macro that Fabio showed me that uh, you smell. In this lecture, I've tried to give you an idea of the variety of these olfactory artworks and of the thought-provoking issues they raise. Grazie. <laughs>